Uh, my name is Chris Saunders, so I'm a senior cloud solutions architect for Red Hat, so that means I'm responsible for the cloud portfolio. Um, I pride myself as being uh, having the best sticker game in Red Hat Canada, so if you need some consulting on your stickers, I can help with that. So we're going to talk about automation today, and I'm going to talk a little bit at a high level the need for automation and where that's going, and then we're going to talk about Ansible specifically um, and how Ansible can actually help you out inside your environment. Just a quick show of hands. I know this always happens in every presentation. We're always looking for a show of hands. But I'd love to know how many of you are actually using Ansible today. OK. Well, you guys will be happy to know you beat Edmonton. There was like three or four people in the room. So that's awesome. So automation is moving to a place where uh, it's starting to impact everything in our society, right? It's not just IT. It's actually across the board. It's, uh, it's inside our homes. It's inside our cars. And uh, the big move today is actually moving from discrete sort of islands of automation and moving into this holistic automation that's happening actually across different, uh, different parts of our lives. And it's all kind of coming together. So today we have navigation systems that tell us where to turn. And I find myself going to customer meetings and I've been to their office you know, dozens of times, but I still plug their address into the, and I don't know why. It's just, but what does happen when I do that, even though I know the turn by turn to actually get there, is that the system will automatically tell me if I need to route around traffic, if there is congestion, if there's an accident, um, and sometimes tell me where I need to stop for gas and those sorts of things. We have cameras in our cars now. I personally can't drive a car without a rear-facing camera anymore. I don't know. It's not because my neck doesn't turn that way anymore. It's just I don't even think about it, right? I look at the camera. And some of you probably drove in cars today that actually have can park themselves, right? That's a degree of automation that is continuing to evolve. Of course, there are sensors to tell us kind of what's going on. But what we really want is this. Um, maybe not to be a middle-aged white guy with questionable fashion choices, but we want to be sitting in a car going where we want to go and just reading a book or more likely you know, staring at our uh, mobile device or using our laptop to do work. I know that's what I would be doing. Aspirationally, I want to read books. I'd probably be sitting there with my laptop doing work, right? But what's really interesting is not having like a self-driving car or like a premium tier self-driving cars. It's when we have fleets of driving cars, self-driving cars that can actually all talk to each other. And now, get that holistic automation I was just referring to, because now we can start to automatically route around things. I don't need to see it. My car just does it, right? And so the reason we're talking about holistic automation in the context of today is because things are changing inside IT. We've been talking about this for years, about how things are changing. But really, we're in a very different place than we were even five years ago. And for the most part, um, what I see talking to customers across the country is that the, the line of business still continues to have the ear of the decision makers, which makes sense, right? If you're inside of a line of business, you're going to either make money or save money for the business, and the board and the executives are going to line up with the decisions that you make. If I can make you $3 million by producing an application, that's something I'm probably willing to actually jump into if I'm an executive. But unfortunately, IT operations kind of ends up holding the bag most of the time. So in my experience as a sysadmin and managing uh, IT operations teams, you know, the business always wins out when it comes between a standard, whether that's a security standard or an audit standard or an ar architecture standard. Um, when an opportunity comes up for the business to make money or save money, as I mentioned, then the business is going to, you're going to be overruled inside operations, right? So the changes that are happening today in the way that we're moving faster and faster, we're deploying applications quicker, we are automating more things, inevitably kind of flows down into the operations team to try and you know, make sense of what, uh, what we're trying to do. And things have changed so dramatically in the IT landscape. Five years ago, we were thinking, OK, private, public cloud environments are going to become like our, an extension of our data center. And it's going to be great. And it's here now, and it's great, but it's also terrible, right? Because you have all of these new objects that you need to manage inside your environment. If you've got Azure, you've got uh, new types of firewalls to configure, new types of networking to think about. You're deploying a different type of VM. Maybe the marketplace images aren't the same as your standard images. I know a lot of you are dealing with that today. So you need to think about different tools and different ways to actually approach the same problems you've been approaching for the last little while. And so Ansible was really built as an answer to this, where we really truly believe that no matter where you are in your organization, automation can actually impact the business and impact your job and move things along. We don't really talk to customers about management strategy much anymore. I mean, you heard this morning from all of our strategy nerds. Um, but 
this is a, we generally talk to customers about an automation strategy now because automation actually encompasses management now because we're thinking about how do you deploy your firewalls, your VMs, your routing tables, how do you update ACLs, that's all part of the, the game now. So it doesn't necessarily always make sense to actually talk about management strategy anymore. Um, you've already got hybrid cloud, you're already trying to manage it, you need to automate most of what's in, the, in that, those environments. M most customers I have are, have already done some degree of automation, but in these silos, right? The server team does their automation in one way. The storage team does their uh, automation in another way. The networking team does things different, containers, et cetera, et cetera, right? And uh, I've worked with so many customers that have spent so much time and money in trying to deploy VMs as quickly as they can, and they get to the end of that journey. They spent millions of dollars, potentially, and it doesn't matter to the business overall because deploying a VM is just, okay, it's a VM, but you still need firewall rules. You need the middleware. You need a database layer. You need all of the stuff that surrounds it, right? Like, just deploying a VM, okay, that's cool. But you have to get actually beyond that and into kind of the next level. So automation in silos is, is still automation. So this is a quote from our friends at Gartner, and I kind of picked it out because I, I like the, the visual here. Uh, today, in a lot of organizations, you have this concept of disconnected islands of spaghetti code. But what you really need in your organization is an automation lasagna across your enterprise, right? And who doesn't like lasagna? So. In other words, your isolated scripts are actually automating functions, but we're in a place now where you really need to think about integrated automation across your organization to automate your entire organization. So Ansible is focused on solving these problems in a, in a, in a very different way. Because it's simple, it's agentless and extensible, so um, you don't need to add another agent into your environment. We're working across SSH, and many of you are already familiar with Ansible, so this is not a new story for you, but uh, the idea that now I don't have to add another agent to my servers is big. Like I manage the fleet of servers uh, at a Canadian bank. We had about 6,000 VMs and every time we were looking for a new solution, it was always install the solution and by the way, we have an agent. Well, I've already got 16 agents as part of my build process. I don't need one more agent, right? So in my mind, based on my experience, having an agent list based solution is, is pretty fantastic. We're going to go a lot more into Ansible today. And in fact, I didn't go over the agenda because I don't really like agenda slides. I just like to get into it. But I'm actually going to show you playbooks. We're going to run a playbook and hopefully add some value from that perspective as well. So we really do think that Ansible can be a universal language of automation that spreads across your organization. So your business folks, your development folks, the security folks, everybody can speak the same language of automation. And that's really powerful to be able to have an entire organization that can look at a same format, a same language, and understand what's happening, that's pretty awesome. Ansible integrates with a lot of technologies today. This is not a comprehensive list, but I like to throw this list up because you've inevitably already zoomed in on the few technologies that you have in your environment, and I wanted to make sure that you got that sense, right? Ansible integrates with a lot of different technologies. The art of the possible here is very broad in terms of what you can automate and what you can then orchestrate kind of on top of that. Stretches beyond, I think, we originally thought about Ansible as really a, a tool for infrastructure, for VMs, for operating systems. It's moved well beyond that now. In fact, the fastest growth right now is around uh, networking automation, and we have teams that are, are um, automating their network functions very, very quickly. Um, I have a customer that I was working with that uh, has thousands of routers, um, and they were, st <laughs> they were still managing ACLs manually believe it or not. I mean, they had sort of this disconnected jumble of automation, um, but you know, every time they needed to change an ACL, it was a change window, they had to wait for the change window, and they had to manually do this ACL change. And as soon as we started showing them Ansible, uh, it was amazing. It saved them literally thousands of hours a year. So the things that you can actually do with Ansible are pretty broad and varied, from advanced orchestration to provisioning to really, you could go as far as to make it your continuous delivery uh, tool set and we can do it on a number of different technologies. So I just wanted to hammer on that point a little bit. It's beyond just deploying VMs, it's beyond just configuring operating systems at this point. So based on my past experiences, uh, the most important thing that I see on this slide is really the version controlled nature. We've been talking about infrastructure as code for a very, very long time, but now we can actually get to that place where the infrastructure actually is code. So. When you build your infrastructure in a playbook, when a, a text file 
is kind of the atomic unit of your data center that describes perfectly how you're deploying the operating system, as well as the applications, the security pieces, all of the things that encompass kind of your application. Once that's in a text file that you can version control somewhere, life becomes a lot easier. So I spend a lot of time in financial services. I have a lot of scars on my back from audit uh, teams. If I could actually, in those environments, be able to point an audit team at a version-controlled repository that describes how I build the systems, and they're built that way every single time, it would have been a dream. I would probably still be there now, actually, but um, I would suggest to you that that's one of the big use cases uh, that you should consider, especially if you're in some environment that actually um, has auditory or uh, compliance issues. So we'll get into the product stuff a little bit now and talk about what Ansible actually is. So when we say Ansible, we're really talking about the automation language, which is a YAML-based language. Again, we're gonna go through that in a little bit more. And we're talking about the automation engine that actually runs these playbooks and actually does things inside of your environment. There's a product that we have that's called Ansible Tower. And think about Tower as really an extension of uh, the automation capabilities. It wraps a UI around running Ansible playbooks and gives you API access to run. Also gives you role-based access control to actually get into the environment and run tasks and run playbooks. And so it really ups the ante and, and allows Ansible to become an enterprise level kind of tool for your orchestration needs. So we'll talk a little bit about how it works now. Uh, the Ansible playbook is a YAML formatted uh, text file. You see in the bottom corner there. And your users that are actually going to deploy things or if you're a system in, you're gonna build stuff, you're gonna build a playbook. And the playbook is gonna call modules. So modules are either written in Python or PowerShell, or at least the ones that we ship to you. You can write a module in any language you want, and, and uh, you can supply them to the community, you can just use them yourself, that's totally up to you. And um, the Ansible playbook actually uses those modules. You're gonna feed information to the module. So as an example, there's a yum module. We're gonna see that a lot more today in a couple of more examples. You're gonna use the yum module and say, I need to see this package installed and it should be at this level, right? And so that would be in the playbook. So that's what modules are, bits of code that actually interface with um, tools that already exist on the system. Once you've actually defined the things that you want to do, then you need to actually run against an inventory. Now the inventory um, can be described in a couple of different ways. I can have a simple text file that's INI style. It could actually be just a list of IP addresses or a list of FQDNs. Generally speaking, you want to try and break that up into groupings, and so you'd have um, a list of web servers, a list of database servers, et cetera. And then once I've actually built that uh, inventory file, I can now address those specific systems. I can either talk directly to one system or to a grouping of systems. So that's great for you know, kind of small use cases, but at scale, most customers have, uh, most customers like yourself, they have VMware environments, they have rev environments, OpenStack, public cloud environments. And in those cases, you're not actually gonna wanna manually put in thousands of servers into a text file, right? And so we supply the capability for you to actually leverage some, what we call dynamic inventories, which actually goes out to your vCenter, talks to your, um, your public cloud environment, and pulls in an inventory that then you can actually act on. So some really interesting use cases actually become possible when you think about building dynamic inventories. Okay, so this is an example of a playbook. It's a very simple playbook, but it's a good uh, illustration of what kind of happens in this environment. And I'm hoping, for those of you that are not familiar with Ansible, that it's pretty simple to understand what we're doing, right? So the three dashes in the beginning of the playbook say, hey, this is a playbook. It's a YAML formatted file. Now, YAML's a little bit finicky, let's say. Um, so you do need to actually learn how to actually format in YAML. It's not complicated, it's just a little bit uh, prescriptive in terms of where the spaces need to be and where you need to put things. So it takes a couple of hours to figure out, okay, this is what YAML is, or you just jump into building and testing playbooks and you'll get a sense relatively quickly of how that actually works. So this playbook uh, it installs and starts Apache, as you would imagine. I'm targeting, the, so the next line in the list here is uh, I'm targeting the web hosts. Become yes means that uh, I actually need to elevate my privileges. So privilege escalation is interesting in Ansible because I can choose how I want to escalate my privileges. Um, I can choose who I want to become and how I actually want to uh, become that user, whether it's SU or sudo or whatever you want to do. For this particular playbook, I actually have an HTT a variable. It's HTTP port 80, and uh, I'm actually going to use that a little bit later in this, uh, in this particular playbook. 
and right. So uh, then we, so that's just the header section, and then I move into the actual task. So these are the things that I'm actually going to do. And so the first task in this list is checking that the HTTP package is, is present. So it's Apache there. And so I'm using the yum module. That's the lines there. I'm looking for the HTTPD um, package, and I want to make sure it's the state latest. So it's interesting that I say state latest. So that means Ansible is actually going to go to the system, and it's going to say, OK, I need to have Apache installed. Is it there? Yes, no. And is it the latest version? If it is the latest version, I don't need to do anything. And Ansible will literally do nothing. I don't need to reinstall it. I know that it's there, so my job is done. My job was to get to this state, and if it's already there and it's the latest version, I'm good. If it's already there but it's not the latest version, then I'm going to install the latest version. And of course, if it's not there at all, then I will install the latest version. The next task in this list is actually uh, grabbing an, an index.html file. So this line, uh, so I'm using the copy module, and that's a bit of code that's a, that is going to help you say, uh, here's a file that I want to copy to the system, and here's where I want the file to be when I'm done, right? So that particular task just takes the index.html file, and it puts it in the var www.html. The last task in this list is just making sure that the HTTPD service is actually started. Okay, so pretty simple, right? So I'd like you to consider thinking about uh, Ansible in this way. We've got an engine underneath, which is actually uh, the thing that does all the automation. So there's an Ansible binary. You feed it a playbook, and it does some, and tell it where to go, and it does some stuff. That's great at you know for doing work when I'm testing on my laptop. It might be okay at some degree of scale, but when you start to think about larger scale, you got hundreds, you have thousands of servers. You're gonna, and you want to have other users potentially use those playbooks, that's when we start to recommend thinking about Ansible Tower because then you actually um, have the ability to provide users access via UI to actually run those playbooks. You have an API that you can programmatically run those playbooks. You can control access to the playbooks, um, and you can actually see the output. So this is just another visualization. I'm a visual kind of guy, so I like to have a few different representations because I know sometimes different visuals click with different folks. But think about Ansible as kind of the blue stuff in the middle, right? I've got a bunch of modules and plugins. I've got my playbooks. They're going to automate stuff inside my enterprise. And then Ansible Tower provides access for users to access the, uh, the automation capabilities. So after the introductory conversation about Ansible, the next logical question that I get into is, when do I need Ansible Tower versus Ansible? And I touched on it a little bit already, but I just wanted to emphasize a couple of points. So Ansible on its own, um, if I'm running on a jump box or if I'm running on my laptop, it's great. It does a lot of great stuff. But you really need to actually, you're managing your security kind of at the level of wherever you're running Ansible from. So if I'm running it on my laptop, I need to have the credentials that allow me to talk to those target systems here, and I need to tell Ansible about those credentials. So there's no abstraction layer there for security. It's I either know the password or I can get the password to a system or a group of systems, and I'm going to use it here to deploy stuff. Tower actually gives us the ability to say, I'm going to build some credentials or get some credentials, and I'm going to put them inside Tower. I can allow users to have access to run a playbook that uses those credentials without actually giving them the credentials, which is super powerful in an enterprise environment, right? You may want to actually have someone be able to build a VM, but you don't necessarily want them to have access to your vCenter or your public cloud environment or what have you. Ansible on its own solves the problem of automation and orchestration, so it lets you automate and orchestration things, um, but it doesn't give you RBAC control. It doesn't give you that uh, credential storage. It also doesn't give you API integrations. So if you're in a shop where you either have CI CD tools that you actually want to integrate with your automation or your orchestration cap uh, capabilities, you need to add something in front of Ansible, and that's what Tower does. So you have an API that you can actually access to run those, uh, those automation jobs. OK, so let's get into the fun stuff. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, once my laptop wakes up, is I'm, I'm going to walk through some playbooks. So I'm going to walk through a couple of simple playbooks, and I'm going to walk through a couple more complex examples and give you, um, hopefully, a good sense of what you can potentially do inside of your environment to get working with Ansible. Uh, so I'm actually going to target the list of web hosts that I have defined in my inventory. Uh, and for this particular playbook, I'm going to install and start Nginx, very similar to the last one. I, I am repeating you know, some tasks here on purpose. Uh, so become yes 
means yes, I need to elevate my privilege. Again, that will uh, that will uh, that privilege escalation happens in whatever manner you've actually defined, right? The three tasks I've listed here, I'm going to use the yum module. I'm going to make sure nginx is in the state present. It means nginx is actually there. I don't actually care about the version in this case. And I'm going to uh, use the copy module to make sure index.html is there. I'm going to copy it into the nginx HTML directory. And I'm going to make sure that the nginx service is started. Right? Sequential tasks, I run through the playbook, nginx is installed up and running with a new index.html file. Pretty simple stuff. All right. Um, one thing I would mention, if you are looking at actually uh, building playbooks yourself and you want to get uh, deeper into uh, playing with it or whatever, most um, most text editors like your Sublime, um, I'm using Atom here, or Visual Studio Code, even Vim and Emacs, you can actually get linters and um, format uh, guides that can actually help help you actually um, visualize better and actually format the, the YAML file and highlight when you're, when you're um, sort of out of compliance with YAML. Uh, so I'm going to get into a slightly more complex playbook here that shows us a couple of interesting things. So one, you, you know, the startup here is very similar. Uh, this time I'm going to install and start Nginx with WSGI, become yes. I've got a more comprehensive variable section here. And um, one of the interesting things here is I'm defining um, you know, an array of variables, basically. And, and what I'm telling Ansible here is that the nginx packages uh, underscore packages variable actually includes these things. Okay? And that's going to become important in a second. And I've got two more variables here that will also become important in a second. And then I'm going to run a loop in the first task. And so for nginx packages are present, I don't want to just install one package. I need to install many packages. And you'll, you'll obviously have to do this uh, in your real world job. Um, you want to install maybe not just one at a time. You don't want a playbook to install one thing at a time. You want to expand beyond that and do a bunch of stuff. So uh, when I say use the yum module, I'm saying uh, here's the name of the module. And uh, item is a special variable that tells Ansible to wait for some stuff. Because it basically says, I'm going to tell you what, what items actually is. There's a loop coming or there's a set of variables coming. So get ready. I say state present. And then the with underscore items here is when I actually sell, tell Ansible here where the items are, right? And so this is actually referring back up to our variable here. And so what will happen is this task will actually loop through every item in the variable list. So I'm actually going to say it, it's the equivalent of if I wrote this out and said yum name each one of those packages in the variable, right? So it's going to cycle through and make sure that they're all installed. The next task I'm doing here is actually installing uh, WSGI, and I'm using the pip module. So similar to yum, in a way, it's a package manager. I'm going to invoke pip, and I'm going to install some stuff. I've changed things a little bit here in that I'm using a template. So I'm not just copying a file. I'm actually using the template module. Now, the template is a special version of the copy module. And it's actually uh, inside of Ansible. I use Jinja2 formatted templates. So I'm going to put variables in a template. And so when I copy the file from uh, the location and move it to the next location, template will actually replace the variables for what, what I've actually put in the playbook or in the scope of the task. So in this case, um, what you'll see is I have the uh, keep alive timeout listed here. And in the template I'm referring to, which is the nginx comp file, I've actually got keep alive timeout parameterized here. So Ansible knows when I run that template and it copies it over, it's going to replace the keep alive timeout with the, uh, the variable that I put in here. The last thing that's probably interesting to note here um, is that I'm actually, when I, when I ran this initial package, I sort of skipped by mentioning this, I'm actually notifying what's called a handler inside Ansible. So this notify statement says, um, you should look for a handler at the end of this playbook called um, restart nginx service. And at the bottom here, sure enough, I've listed a handler. And all this handler does, oh, can you see that OK? Um, so the handler here at the bottom, when I finish the task at the top, it's going to notify this handler if something has happened. So if a change has occurred, the task is going to say, all right, I need to notify this handler, and I'm going to run these uh, particular items. So you see in a number of these tasks, I actually notify the handler because I need to restart Nginx. So great. Um, once I'm done actually installing the packages, I restart uh, Nginx. 
once I've actually changed the configuration file, I restart, right? So I just wanted to expose you to the concept of a handler. Playbooks can get much, much, much more complex than this. Um, due to time constraints, I'm not gonna go into roles. I'm not gonna go into um, you know, some of the more complex scenarios. But suffice to say, docs.ansible.com is your friend. There's a lot of information there on how much more complicated things can get. I'm gonna show you a playbook that leverages, uh, um, that leverages Ansible Tower. So when I log into Ansible, this is a pretty modest environment. It's just my test environment. Uh, it's a VM that's actually deployed on, um, on AWS and it's running, uh, it's running the latest version of Tower. And so what's relevant to our conversation here for the job that I'm about to show you, um, the way that Ansible Tower thinks about things is, uh, as I mentioned, we really wanna make sure that everything, that your infrastructure is code and it's all version controlled. So I build a project and I actually point that, I, the project is really a GitHub, a Git-based repository. It can be any sort of source control repository. The most often, or the most common thing that I use and we use in POCs is GitHub. So, a project in this case is actually uh, pointing at a GitHub repository. And so I have a, a project here that points to my GitHub and a particular directory, and it's looking at a particular branch. It can update on launch, and that means um, whenever I launch a job, it's actually gonna update. I mentioned credentials a couple of times because I think this is a really important capability and this is gonna come up when I actually get to the, the job in a second. So I actually have a, a machine credential here that is a username plus a private key and it's stored here in Ansible. So um, unless I give users permission to see it, they can't actually go in and see the details about this, uh, this particular credential. They may be able to use it depending on their permissions but I control those permissions. Um, I've also got my Azure credentials listed in here. I'm just looking for anyone taking pictures. No, okay, good. Um, so uh, if you've used Azure before, you know that, you know, great public cloud environment, but it's a little bit wacky in a couple of areas, like credentials. You need to have a lot of different information to actually talk programmatically to Azure to do stuff, right? I see some nodding heads, I like that. Um, so Tower gives me the ability to define these credentials in here, and now I can use them in playbooks. And this is relevant with the playbook that I'm gonna show you and actually run. Now this playbook, I'm actually just creating, um, creating a VM in Azure. And so I built this for a customer in Quebec actually, who was just doing some basic testing and wanted to basically run the, the use case that I've been describing for a while. Like you wanna deploy a VM, but you don't wanna give everyone access to the cloud. You just need to give them like, here's our standard build and here's how you can build it in the cloud. Go talk to Tower and, and get that done. So this particular playbook actually only uses one module. It uses this Azure RM virtual machine module, which is built by Microsoft. And there's a bunch of uh, parameters to this particular module. So you see subscription ID, client ID, tenant secret. This is all the stuff that, um, that uh, Ansible needs to actually talk to Azure. Uh, VM size that's listed here is actually, this is important, needs to be a VM size that Azure actually has that's in the marketplace that is available to the user. I'm gonna deploy a Linux VM probably shocking to most of you since you're at a Red Hat event. Um, and then I need to actually say SSH password enabled false because I don't want anyone just hitting this from anywhere and trying to um, you know, hack into it. Because I say password is not enabled, now I actually need to give Azure, when I build this VM in Azure, I need to tell it where to put a key and which key to actually put it into the, the configuration. I've defined an admin username and I've also defined an image. So this is a little bit peculiar to Azure but um, just the terminology here. So when I say I wanna use a marketplace image, I have to describe the offer, the publisher, the SKU, and the version. So uh, this playbook is actually on GitHub, and if you wanna download it and use it, feel free to. It actually has, you know, it's a good starting kind of block here. Now the interesting stuff that I kind of skipped past is, is the, are the variables that are listed here, right? So because this is a tower, um, this playbook is built for tower, when it runs, it's executing in an environment that knows these parameters. So it knows the, because I told the, the job template is built to actually refer to the Azure um, cloud credentials. So I can actually pull those credentials out of the environment at runtime, right? So when I run this, if I say it another way, when I run this playbook, I can do this lookup and I get the subscription ID. So now I can build a playbook that just has this variable listed in it and I don't have to actually expose uh, the subscription ID or any of the other credentials, right? 
Um, I've also got a survey attached to this particular job. And let me show you what that looks like. Because I should have actually gone to the template first, but I got a little nervous. So this is the job that I'm actually going to run in a second. And you can see it's referring to the playbook that we were just looking at. It's using the cloud credential that I described. And uh, it's using the machine credential that we looked at very briefly, right? So this is how Tower is actually going to run the playbook. This is how I tell Tower to run that playbook that we were just looking at. And I've created a survey in here. And so the survey actually shows um, these are items that I'm going to prompt the user for. So I want the user to tell me the VM name. I want, me, I want them to tell me the resource group. And I want them to tell me the public SSH key. So what's the SSH key that you're actually going to use? So this is a survey. It means when I run the job, the user is going to get this prompt, and they fill in this information. And then that information gets put into the, the runtime environment when Ansible actually executes in Tower. So that's what these, these variables are. I'm telling the playbook, actually, you're going to get this variable. And so when it runs, it pulls that information out of the survey. These are arbitrary variable names. They just need to match up. So OK. So let me go back to the template. <clears throat> so this is the template I checked on, or I clicked on before, and we were just looking at the actual um, playbook. You can see here's all the troubleshooting I was doing when I was trying to build it, um, because I wasn't quite familiar with the Ansible or the uh, Azure module quite yet. So I, I did some bad things, and things didn't work for a long time. And so you can see here, though, um, when I run an Ansible job, I have a lot of information available in Tower about what's actually happening when it runs. I know, uh, I know that this one failed. I also know when it started, it finished. I know what template I'm using. I know who ran it. I know which revision based on when it was checked out. I also know um, what credentials were being used and any extra variables that are passed. So in this case, because it was taking information from a survey, I actually see that in here as well. And I see the full output of actually running the playbook listed in here. So again, for audit teams or for you know, environments that have had heavy audit um, requirements, this is a dream come true. You can point audit teams at, uh, at the interface, or you can potentially ship those logs somewhere else so that they can look at you know, all the builds and the configuration that's actually happening. The only thing, the last thing I was going to do is actually run it and prove to you that this actually works. So we're going to call this Azure VM01. Um, the resource group listed here is actually Predefined, it's actually defined in Azure, right? And then I need to actually get a key, uh, which is just my public. Sorry, it's probably more interesting if you see what I'm up to here. So it's pretty simple. I'm just taking my pub public key here, and I'm just going to copy and paste it into there. Uh, it's crude, but it's a very simple, just a simple way to demonstrate um, how this is going to work. And this is just taking that key and, and planting it into Azure. So then off it's going to go and do its thing. So yeah, I had some slides on this, and I kind of left it out. But yeah, we just recently open sourced Tower. And so Tower is feature complete. And what, Red Hat, what we do at Red Hat is we participate in open upstream communities. We generally uh, contribute code upstream first. And then we run our QA cycles and tests. And we build something that then we charge for support for, right? So the new AWX project, or the new old AWX project, if you've been around Ansible for a while, you know that Tower was originally called AWX. And then it became Ansible Tower, and then it became Red Hat Ansible Tower. Anyway, the, so the upstream version of Tower now is AWX. It is like every other you know, open source community here at Red Hat. Um, we sponsor it. We do a lot of the development. We try and foster the community there, make sure everybody can contribute to it. Um, and so it, in, in this, the same way that other upstream projects work, where you will find the latest and greatest features there. You will also find you know, the jagged edges there of an upstream community project that is moving quickly. Um, but it is definitely feature complete, and it is fully uh, open source and free. Yeah. Now, the other change that happened was, so Ansible was always that way, right? So the Ansible engine itself, you could go to GitHub and download. You can do pip install and download. Um, and that was always open source and just free to use, basically. But we found customers, actually, they want to pay for support for Ansible Engine. So for customers that just want to use it, like on a jump box, they just want the binary, they want the capability to actually deploy stuff, use the modules, and run some playbooks, 
Um, they want support from Red Hat for that, for the modules to make sure that things work. So if it's broken, they can go to someone. So now, you couldn't do this before, but now you can actually pay, uh, you can get a, an entitlement for uh, support of the Ansible engine itself. Um, so there's kind of two changes that happen to the Ansible project. Now you've got uh, Tower for free upstream, or AWX as an upstream um, pairing of Tower, and then you've also got the uh, uh, support of the Ansible engine. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any further questions about Ansible, uh, Ansible Tower, feel free to send me an email, chrisb at redhat.com, or talk to me afterwards. I wanna thank you for your time. <laughs>